the human chair by Edogawa Rampo. Yoshiko saw her husband off to his work at the foreign office at a little past ten o'clock. Then, now that her time was once again her very own, she shut herself up in the study she shared with her husband to resume work on the story she was to submit for the special summer issue of K Magazine. She was a versatile writer with high literary talent and a smooth, flowing style. Even her husband's popularity as a diplomat was overshadowed by hers as an authoress. Daily, she was overwhelmed with letters from readers praising her works. In fact, this very morning, as soon as she sat down before her desk, she immediately proceeded to glance through the numerous letters which the morning mail had brought. Without exception, in content, they all followed the same pattern, but prompted by her deep feminine sense of consideration. She always read through each piece of correspondence addressed to her, whether monotonous or interesting. Taking the short and simple letters first, she quickly noted their contents. Finally, she came to one which was a bulky manuscript-like sheaf of pages. Although she had not received any advance notice that a manuscript was to be sent her, still it was not uncommon for her to receive the efforts of amateur writers seeking her valuable criticism. In most cases, these were long-winded, pointless, and yawn-provoking attempts at writing. Nevertheless, she now opened the envelope in her hand and took out the numerous closely written sheets. As she had anticipated, it was a manuscript carefully bound. But somehow, for some unknown reason, there was neither a title nor a byline. The manuscript began abruptly, Dear Madam. Momentarily, she reflected. Maybe, after all, it was just a letter. Unconsciously, her eyes hurried on to read two or three lines, and then gradually she became absorbed in a strangely gruesome narrative. Her curiosity aroused to the bursting point and spurred on by some unknown magnetic force. She continued to read, Dear Madam, I do hope you will forgive this presumptuous letter from a complete stranger. What I am about to write, madam, may shock you no end. However, I am determined to lay bare before you a confession my own and to describe in detail the terrible crime I have committed. For many months I have hidden myself away from the light of civilization, hidden, as it were, like the devil himself. In this whole wide world no one knows of my deeds. However, quite recently, a queer change took place in my conscious mind, and I just couldn't bear to keep my secret any longer. I simply had to confess. All that I have written so far must certainly have awakened only perplexity in your mind. However, I beseech you to bear with me and kindly read my communication to the bitter end, because if you do, you will fully understand the strange workings of my mind and the reason why it is to you, in particular, that I make this confession. I am really at a loss as to where to begin, for the facts which I am setting forth are all so grotesquely out of the ordinary. Frankly, words fail me, for human words seem utterly inadequate to sketch all the detail. But, nevertheless, I will try to lay bare the events in chronological order, just as they happened. First, let me explain that I am ugly beyond description. Please bear this fact in mind. Otherwise, I fear that if and when you do grant my ultimate request and do see me, you may be shocked and horrified at the sight of my face after so many months of unsanitary living. However, I implore you to believe me when I state that, despite the extreme ugliness of my face, within my heart there has always burned a pure and overwhelming passion. Next, let me explain that I am a humble workman by trade. Had I been born in a well-to-do family, I might have found the power with money, to ease the torture of my soul brought on by my ugliness. Or perhaps, if I had been endowed by nature with artistic talents, I might again have been able to forget my bestial countenance and seek consolation in music or poetry. But, unblessed with any such talents, and being the unfortunate creature that I am, I had no trade to turn to except that of a humble cabinet maker. Eventually my specialty became that of making assorted types of chairs. In this particular line, I was fairly successful, to such a degree, in fact, that I gained the reputation of being able to satisfy any kind of order, no matter how complicated. For this reason, in woodworking circles, I came to enjoy the special privilege of accepting only orders for luxury chairs, with complicated requests for unique carvings, new designs for the backrest and arm support, fancy padding for the cushions and seat, all work of a nature which called for skilled hands and patient trial and study work which an amateur craftsman could hardly undertake. 
The reward for all my pains, however, lay in the sheer delight of creating. You may even consider me a braggart when you hear this, but it all seemed to me to be the same type of thrill which a true artist feels upon creating a masterpiece. As soon as a chair was completed, it was my usual custom to sit on it to see how it felt, and despite the dismal life of one of my humble profession, at such moments I experienced an indescribable thrill. Giving my mind free rein, I used to imagine the types of people who would eventually curl up in the chair. Certainly people of nobility living in palatial residences with exquisite priceless paintings hanging on the walls, glittering crystal chandeliers hanging from the ceilings, expensive rugs on the floor, etc. And one particular chair, which I imagined standing before a mahogany table, gave me the vision of fragrant western flowers scenting the air with sweet perfume. Enwrapped in these strange visions, I came to feel that I, too, belonged to such settings, and I derived no end of pleasure from imagining myself to be an influential figure in society. Foolish thoughts such as these kept coming to me in rapid succession. Imagine, madam, the pathetic figure I made, sitting comfortably in a luxurious chair of my own making and pretending that I was holding hands with the girl of my dream. As was always the case, however, the noisy chattering of the uncouth women of the neighborhood and the hysterical shrieking, babbling, and wailing of their children quickly dispelled all my beautiful dream. Again, grim reality reared its ugly head before my eyes. Once back to earth, I again found myself a miserable creature, a helpless, crawling worm. And as for my beloved, that angelic woman, she too vanished like a mist. I cursed myself for my folly. Why, even the dirty women tending babies in the streets did not so much as bother to glance in my direction. Every time I completed a new chair, I was haunted by feelings of utter despair, and with the passing of the months, my long accumulated misery was enough to choke me. One day I was charged with the task of making a huge leather-covered armchair of a type I had never before conceived for a foreign hotel located in Yokohama. Actually, this particular type of chair was to have been imported from abroad, but through the persuasion of my employer, who admired my skill as a chairmaker, I received the order. In order to live up to my reputation as a super craftsman, I began to devote myself seriously to my new assignment. Steadily, I became so engrossed in my labors that at times I even skipped food and sleep. Really, it would be no exaggeration to state that the job became my very life, every fiber of the wood I used seemingly linked to my heart and soul. At last, when the chair was completed, I experienced a satisfaction hitherto unknown, for I honestly believed I had achieved a piece of work which immeasurably surpassed all my other creation. As before, I rested the weight of my body on the four legs that supported the chair, first dragging it to a sunny spot on the porch of my workshop. What comfort! What supreme luxury! Not too hard or too soft, the springs seemed to match the cushion with uncanny precision. And as for the leather, what an alluring touch it possessed. This chair not only supported the person who sat in it, but it also seemed to embrace and to hug. Still further, I also noted the perfect reclining angle of the back support, the delicate puffy swelling of the armrests, the perfect symmetry of each of the component parts. Surely no product could have expressed with greater eloquence the definition of the word. Comfort. I let my body sink deeply into the chair and, caressing the two armrests with my hands, gasped with genuine satisfaction and pleasure. Again my imagination began to play its usual tricks, raising strange fancies in my mind. The scene which I imagined now rose before my eyes so vividly that, for a moment, I asked myself if I were not slowly going insane. While in this mental condition, a weird idea suddenly leaped to my mind. Assuredly, it was the whispering of the devil himself. Although it was a sinister idea, it attracted me with a powerful magnetism which I found impossible to resist. At first, no doubt, the idea found its seed in my secret yearning to keep the chair for myself. Realizing, however, that this was totally out of the question, I next longed to accompany the chair wherever it went. Slowly but steadily, as I continued to nurse this fantastic notion, my mind fell into the grip of an almost terrifying temptation. Imagine, madam, I really and actually made up my mind to carry out that awful scheme to the end. Come what may, quickly, I took the armchair apart and then put it together again to suit my weird purposes. As it was a large armchair with the seat covered right down to the level of the floor, and furthermore, as the backrest and arm supports were all large in dimensions, I soon contrived to make the cavity inside large enough to accommodate a man without any danger of exposure. Of course, 
My work was hampered by the large amount of wooden framework and the springs inside, but with my usual skill as a craftsman, I remodeled the chair so that the knees could be placed below the seat, the torso and the head inside the backrest. Seated thus in the cavity, one could remain perfectly concealed. As this type of craftsmanship came as second nature to me, I also added a few finishing touches, such as improved acoustics to catch outside noises, and of course a peephole cut out in the leather but absolutely unnoticeable. Furthermore, I also provided storage space for supplies, wherein I placed a few boxes of hardtack and a water bottle. For another of nature's needs, I also inserted a large rubber bag, and by the time I finished fitting the interior of the chair with these and other unique facilities, it had become quite a habitable place, but not for longer than two or three days at a stretch. Completing my weird task, I stripped down to my waist and buried myself inside the chair. Just imagine the strange feeling I experienced, madam. Really, I felt that I had buried myself in a lonely grave. Upon careful reflection, I realized that it was indeed a grave. As soon as I entered the chair, I was swallowed up by complete darkness and to everyone else in the world, I no longer existed. Presently, a messenger arrived from the dealers to take delivery of the armchair, bringing with him a large handcart. My apprentice, the only person with whom I lived, was utterly unaware of what had happened. I saw him talking to the messenger. While my chair was being loaded onto the handcart, one of the cart pullers exclaimed, Good God, this chair certainly is heavy. It must weigh a ton. When I heard this, my heart leapt to my mouth. However, as the chair itself was obviously an extraordinarily heavy one, no suspicions were aroused, and before long I could feel the vibration of the rattling handcart being pulled along the street. Of course, I worried incessantly, but at length, that same afternoon, the armchair in which I was concealed was placed with a thud on the floor of a room in the hotel. Later I discovered that it was not an ordinary room, but the lobby. Now, as you may already have guessed long ago, my key motive in this mad venture was to leave my hole in the chair when the coast was clear, loiter around the hotel, and start stealing. Who would dream that a man was concealed inside a chair? Like a fleeting shadow, I could ransack every room at will, and by the time any alarm was sounded, I would be safe and sound inside my sanctuary, holding my breath and observing the ridiculous antics of the people outside looking for me. Possibly you've heard of the hermit crab that is often found on coastal rocks. Shaped like a large spider, this crab crawls about stealthily and as soon as it hears footsteps, quickly retreats into an empty shell from which hiding place with gruesome hairy front legs partly exposed, it looks furtively about, I was just like this freak monster crab. But instead of a shell, I had a better shield, a chair which would conceal me far more effectively. As you can imagine, my plan was so unique and original, so utterly unexpected, that no one was ever the wiser. Consequently, my adventure was a complete success. On the third day after my arrival at the hotel, I discovered that I had already taken in quite a haul. Imagine the thrill and excitement of being able to rob to my heart's content, not to mention the fun I derived from observing the people rushing hither and thither, only a few inches away under my very nose, shouting, The thief went this way, and he went that way. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to describe all my experiences in detail. Rather, allow me to proceed with my narrative and tell you of a far greater source of weird joy, which I managed to discover, in fact, what I'm about to relate now is the key point of this letter. First, however, I must request you to turn your thoughts back to the moment when my chair and I were both placed in the lobby of the hotel. As soon as the chair was put on the floor, all the various members of the staff took turns testing out the seat. After the novelty wore off, they all left the room, and then silence reigned, absolute and complete. However, I could not find the courage to leave my sanctum, for I began to imagine a thousand dangers. For what seemed like ages, I kept my ears alerted for the slightest sound. After a while, I heard heavy footsteps drawing near, evidently from the direction of the corridor. The next moment, the unknown feet must have started to tread on a heavy carpet, for the walking sound died out completely. Sometime later, the sound of a man panting, all out of breath, assailed my ears. Before I could anticipate what the next development would be, a large, heavy body like that of a European fell on my knees and seemed to bounce two or three times before settling down. With just a thin layer of leather between the seat of his trousers and my knees, I could almost feel the warmth of his body. As for his broad, muscular shoulders, they rested flatly against my chest while his two heavy arms were deposited squarely on mine. I could imagine this individual puffing away at his cigar for the strong aroma came floating to my nostrils. Just imagine yourself in my queer position, madam and reflect for a brief moment on the utterly unnatural state of affairs. As for myself, however, I was utterly frightened, 
so much so that I crouched in my dark hideout as if petrified, cold sweat running down my armpit. Beginning with this individual, several people sat on my knees that day as if they had patiently awaited their turn. No one, however, suspected even for a fleeting moment that the soft cushion on which they were sitting was actually human flesh with blood circulating its veins confined in a strange world of darkness. What was it about this mystic hole that fascinated me so? I somehow felt like an animal living in a totally new world, and as for the people who lived in the world outside, I could distinguish them only as people who made weird noises, breathed heavily, talked, rustled their clothes, and possessed soft, round bodies. Gradually, I could begin to distinguish the sitters just by the sense of touch rather than of sight. Those who were fat felt like large jellyfish, while those who were especially thin made me feel that I was supporting a skeleton. Other distinguishing factors consisted of the curve of the spine, the breadth of the shoulder blades, the length of the arms, and the thickness of their thighs, as well as the contour of their bottom. It may seem strange, but I speak nothing but the truth when I say that. Although all people may seem alike, there are countless distinguishing traits among all men which can be seen merely by the feel of their bodies. In fact, there are just as many differences as in the case of fingerprints or facial contours. This theory, of course, also applies to female bodies. Usually women are classified in two large categories, the plain and the beautiful. However, in my dark, confined world inside the chair, facial merits or demerits were of secondary importance, being overshadowed by the more meaningful qualities found in the feel of flesh, the sound of the voice, body odor. Madam, I do hope you will not be offended by the boldness with which I sometimes speak. And so, to continue with my narration, there was one girl the first who ever sat on me who kindled in my heart a passionate love. Judging solely by her voice, she was European. At the moment, although there was no one else present in the room, her heart must have been filled with happiness because she was singing with a sweet voice when she came tripping into the room. Soon I heard her standing immediately in front of my chair and without giving any warning, she suddenly burst into laughter. The very next moment I could hear her flapping her arms like a fish struggling in a net and then she sat down on me. For a period of about 30 minutes, she continued to sing, moving her body and feet in tempo with her melody. For me, this was quite an unexpected development, for I had always held aloof from all members of the opposite sex because of my ugly face. Now I realized that I was present in the same room with a European girl whom I had never seen, my skin virtually touching hers through a thin layer of leather. Unaware of my presence, she continued to act with unreserved freedom, doing as she pleased. Inside the chair, I could visualize myself hugging her, kissing her snowy white neck, if only I could remove that layer of leather. Following this somewhat unhallowed but nevertheless enjoyable experience, I forgot all about my original intentions of committing robbery. Instead, I seemed to be plunging headlong into a new whirlpool of maddening pleasure. Long, I pondered. Maybe I was destined to enjoy this type of existence. Gradually, the truth seemed to dawn on me. For those who were as ugly and as shunned as myself, it was assuredly wiser to enjoy life inside a chair, for in this strange, dark world I could hear and touch all desirable creatures. Love in a chair. This may seem altogether too fantastic. Only one who has actually experienced it will be able to vouch for the thrills and the joys it provides. Of course, it is a strange sort of love, limited to the senses of touch, hearing and smell, a love burning in a world of darkness. Believe it or not, many of the events that take place in this world are beyond full understanding. In the beginning, I had intended only to perpetrate a series of robberies and then flee. Now, however, I became so attached to my quarters that I adjusted them more and more to permanent living. In my nocturnal prowlings, I always took the greatest of precautions, watching each step I took hardly making a sound. Hence, there was little danger of being detected. When I recall, however, that I spent several months inside the chair without being discovered even once. It indeed surprises even me. For the better part of each day, I remained inside the chair, sitting like a contortionist with my arms folded and knees bent. As a consequence, I felt as if my whole body was paralyzed. Furthermore, as I could never stand up straight, my muscles became taut and inflexible, and gradually I began to crawl instead of walk to the washroom. What a madman I was. Even in the face of all these sufferings, I could not persuade myself to abandon my folly and leave that weird world of sensuous pleasure. In the hotel, although there were several guests who stayed for a month or even two, making the place their home, 
there was always a constant inflow of new guests and an equal exodus of the old. As a result, I could never manage to enjoy a permanent love. Even now, as I bring back to mind all my love affairs, I can recall nothing but the touch of warm flesh. Some of the women possessed the firm bodies of ponies, others seemed to have the slimy bodies of snakes, and still others had bodies composed of nothing but fat, giving them the bounce of a rubber ball. There were also the unusual exceptions who seemed to have bodies made only of sheer muscle, like artistic Greek statues. But notwithstanding the species or types, one and all had a special magnetic allure quite distinctive from the others, and I was perpetually shifting the object of my passions. At one time, for example, an internationally famous dancer came to Japan and happened to stay at the same hotel. Although she sat in my chair only on one single occasion, the contact of her smooth, soft flesh against my own afforded me a hitherto unknown thrill. So divine was the touch of her body that I felt inspired to a state of positive exaltation. On this occasion, instead of my carnal instincts being aroused, I simply felt like a gifted artist being caressed by the magic wand of a fairy. Strange, eerie episodes followed in rapid succession. However, as space prohibits, I shall refrain from giving a detailed description of each and every case. Instead, I shall continue to outline the general course of events. One day, several months following my arrival at the hotel, there suddenly occurred an unexpected change in the shape of my destiny. For some reason, the foreign proprietor of the hotel was forced to leave for his homeland, and, as a result, the management was transferred to Japanese hands. Originating from this change in proprietorship, a new policy was adopted, calling for a drastic retrenchment in expenditures, abolishment of luxurious fittings, and other steps to increase profits through economy. One of the first results of this new policy was that the management put all the extravagant furnishings of the hotel up for auction. Included in the list of items for sale was my chair. When I learned of this new development, I immediately felt the greatest of disappointments. Soon, however, a voice inside me advised that I should return to the natural world outside and spend the tidy sum I had acquired by stealing. I, of course, realized that I would no longer have to return to my humble life as a craftsman, for actually I was comparatively wealthy. The thought of my new role in society seemed to overcome my disappointment in having to leave the hotel. Also, when I reflected deeply on all the pleasures which I had derived there, I was forced to admit that although my love affairs had been many, they had all been with foreign women, and that somehow something had always been lacking. I then realized fully and deeply that as a Japanese, I really craved a lover of my own kind. While I was turning these thoughts over in my kind, my chair with me still in it was sent to a furniture store to be sold at an auction. Maybe this time I told myself the chair will be purchased by a Japanese and kept in a Japanese home. With my fingers crossed, I decided to be patient and to continue with my existence in the chair a while longer. Although I suffered for two or three days in my chair while it stood in front of the furniture store, eventually it came up for sale and was promptly purchased. This, fortunately, was because of the excellent workmanship which had gone into its making, and although it was no longer new, it still had a dignified bearing. The purchaser was a high-ranking official who lived in Tokyo. When I was being transferred from the furniture store to the man's palatial residence, the bouncing and vibrating of the vehicle almost killed me. I gritted my teeth and bore up bravely, however, comforted by the thought that at last I had been bought by a Japanese. Inside his house, I was placed in a spacious, Western-style study. One thing about the room which gave me the greatest of satisfactions was the fact that my chair was meant more for the use of his young and attractive wife than for his own. Within a month, I had come to be with the wife, constantly united with her as one, so to speak. With the exception of the dining and sleeping hours, her soft body was always seated on my knees for the simple reason that she was engaged in a deep-thinking task. You have no idea how much I love this lady. She was the first Japanese woman with whom I had ever come into such close contact, and moreover, she possessed a wonderfully appealing body. She seemed the answer to all my prayers, compared with this, all my other, affairs. With the various women in the hotel seemed like childish flirtations, nothing more. Proof of the mad love which I now cherished for this intellectual lady was found in the fact that I longed to hold her every moment of the time. When she was away, even for a fleeting moment, I waited for her return like a love-crazed Romeo yearning for his Juliet. Such feelings I had never hitherto experienced. Gradually, I came to want to convey my feelings to her, somehow. 
I tried vainly to carry out my purpose, but always encountered a blank wall, for I was absolutely helpless. Oh, how I longed to have her reciprocate my love. Yes, you may consider this the confession of a madman, for I was mad, madly in love with her. But how could I signal to her? If I revealed myself, the shock of the discovery would immediately prompt her to call her husband and the servants. And that, of course, would be fatal to me, for exposure would not only mean disgrace, but severe punishment for the crimes I had committed. I therefore decided on another course of action, namely, to add in every way to her comfort and thus awaken in her a natural love for the chair. As she was a true artist, I somehow felt confident that her natural love of beauty would guide her in the direction I desired. And as for myself, I was willing to find pure contentment in her love, even for a material object, for I could find solace in the belief that her delicate feelings of love for even a mere chair were powerful enough to penetrate to the creature that dwelt inside, which was myself. In every way, I endeavored to make her more comfortable every time she placed her weight on my chair. Whenever she became tired from sitting long in one position on my humble person, I would slowly move my knees and embrace her more warmly, making her more snug. And when she dozed off to sleep, I would move my knees ever so softly to rock her into a deeper slumber, somehow, possibly by a miracle. Or was it just my imagination? Hmm? This lady now seemed to love my chair deeply, for every time she sat down, she acted like a baby falling into a mother's embrace or a girl surrendering herself into the arms of her lover. And when she moved herself about in the chair, I felt that she was feeling an almost amorous joy. In this way, the fire of my love and passion rose into a leaping flame that could never be extinguished and I finally reached a stage where I simply had to make a strange, bold plea. Ultimately, I began to feel that if she would just look at me, even for a brief passing moment, I could die with the deepest contentment. No doubt, madam, by this time, you must certainly have guessed who the object of my mad passion is. To put it explicitly, she happens to be none other than yourself, madam. Ever since your husband brought the chair from that furniture store, I have been suffering excruciating pains because of my mad love and longing for you. I am but a worm, a loathsome creature. I have but one request. Could you meet me once, just once? I will ask nothing further of you. I, of course, do not deserve your sympathy, for I have always been nothing but a villain, unworthy even to touch the soles of your feet. But if you will grant me this one request just out of compassion, my gratitude will be eternal. Last night I stole out of your residence to write this confession because, even leaving aside the danger, I did not possess the courage to meet you suddenly face to face without any warning or preparation. While you are reading this letter, I will be roaming around your house with bated breath. If you will agree to my request, please place your handkerchief on the pot of flowers that stands outside your window. At this signal, I will open your front door and enter as a humble visitor. Thus ended the letter. Even before Yoshiko had read many pages, some premonition of evil had caused her to become deadly pale. Rising unconsciously, she had fled from the study, from that chair upon which she had been seated, and had sought sanctuary in one of the Japanese rooms of her house. For a moment it had been her intention to stop reading and tear up the eerie message, but somehow she had read on with the closely written sheets laid on a low desk. Now that she had finished, her premonition was proved correct, that chair in which she had sat from day to day. Had it really contained a man? If true, what a horrible experience she had unknowingly undergone. A sudden chill came over her, as if ice water had been poured down her back, and the shivers that followed seemed never to stop. Like one in a trance, she gazed into space. Should she examine the chair? But how could she possibly steel herself for such a horrible ordeal? Even though the chair might now be empty, what about the filthy remains, such as the food and other necessary items which he must have used? Madam, a letter for you. With a start, she looked up and found her maid standing at the doorway with an envelope in her hand. In a daze, Yoshiko took the envelope and stifled a scream. Horror of horrors. It was another message from the same man. Again, her name was written in that same familiar scrawl. For a long while, she hesitated, wondering whether she should open it. At last, she mustered up enough courage to break the seal and shakingly took out the pages. This second communication was short and curt, and it contained another breathtaking surprise. Forgive my boldness in addressing another message to you. 
To begin with, I merely happen to be one of your ardent admirers. The manuscript which I submitted to you under separate cover was based on pure imagination and my knowledge that you had recently bought that chair. It is a sample of my own humble attempts at fictional writing. If you would kindly comment on it, I shall know no greater satisfaction. For personal reasons, I submitted my manuscript prior to writing this letter of explanation, and I assume you have already read it. How did you find it? If, madam, you have found it amusing or entertaining in some degree, I shall feel that my literary efforts have not been wasted. Although I purposely refrain from telling you in the manuscript, I intend to give my story the title of The Human Chair. With all my deepest respects and sincere wishes, I remain cordially yours.